What is up, folks? Kyle here, and welcome to episode two of the Line em Up podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about best and worst movies of 2017, uh, as I outlined in my previous episode, if you've seen it, or, well, heard it. Anyway, covered a lot of different shows in that one, so this one, uh, I'm going to try to be as concise as possible, because uh, I have a lot of movies that I saw this year, a lot of ones that I enjoyed, and a lot of ones that were kind of garbage to me. Uh, so we're going to get into it, uh, we're going to be talking a lot about uh, some very basic aspects, not going to be full reviews, obviously, uh, but just kind of the general things that I liked or disliked about each movie. So, let's get into it. I feel like this was a really important year for filmmaking. Uh, it was certainly a very divisive year in filmmaking. But, you know, we, we gave more power to the content creators again. Uh, it, this year, it didn't feel like a lot of these movies were made by committee. A lot of big blockbuster movies, they didn't feel like they were made by a committee, which is important. You've got to let a director share their vision with the world. You can't let them be tempered by, you know, a fucking producer telling you to to add extraneous scenes to establish sequels or, you know, adding a bunch of fucking stuff for merchandising um, and, and just different things that has kind of bogged down filmmaking at this point. Uh, and, and I'm glad because, like, a lot of these movies that are on this list, you can clearly tell that they're made by people with a passion for film and that they care about their craft and that they have, you know, a very unique way of looking at the world. And it's through the lens of, you know, these larger-than-life characters. So one of the first ones I wanted to talk about was It. Uh, IT. It. An adaptation of the Stephen King book. It. Okay, you know what I'm talking about. The one about the creepy clown and, and the kids. This, you know, this movie, when I first heard about it, I was pretty lukewarm i gotta be honest i was not stoked to see another uh adaptation of it i just didn't think that it needed to be done but it worked really well and i you know before i went and saw this i actually went and i rewatched the tv movie and you know tim curry's performance still holds up but there is a lot of there there are actually a lot of issues with the tv movie uh that i i didn't notice in the theatrical movie uh which is good of course they got off uh, what is it finn wolfhard from stranger things so a lot of people have compared it to stranger things uh, but i wouldn't i wouldn't really say it's you know if anything it's more like a nightmare on elm street or something like that and a nightmare on elm street is one of the best fucking horror movies of all time it's one of my favorites i love wes craven i thought that he did a fantastic job with that franchise and it borrows a lot of elements from nightmare on elm street um but uh and, and you know it does have a lot of jump scares and different things like that but i loved it i i thought that it was a good way to tackle it as a as a movie the tv movie what i really despised about it was I despise this, was that it kept cutting back and forth between these characters as adults and then going back to them as children. So what I liked is that it just focused on them as the kids and their experience. And then now we're going to be getting a sequel where it's strictly focusing on their lives as adults. The kids stuff in the TV show or the TV movie was good, but it got bogged down by that, that relationship to the adult selves. And the adult side was just god awful. There's a lot of weird shit in the novel. You know, there's gigantic flying space turtles and, uh, you know, ancient evils that are, are basically Lovecraftian and different things like that. This movie didn't go too far into the lore. It hinted at things like that, which I liked. But it was a very clear cut story. The kids were fantastic actors, beautifully shot, creepy fucking super creepy and it it just was visually stunning uh, i thought that uh 
uh, what's his name? Um, Bill Skarsgård. That's it. Bill Skarsgård did a fantastic job as Pennywise. He brought his own flair to it. I like that it was like this, you know, 19th century, like Victorian era clown. And he just had this very calculated performance. His demeanor was off-putting. His line delivery was superb. He really sold Pennywise to me, and that was a big part of it because a lot of people were like, well, you can't fucking replace Tim Curry, and he didn't replace him. He did his own thing, and he succeeded at it, and I I loved it. So it's a fantastic movie. Of course, you know, it, it does have a lot of jump scares, but they're effective. They're a lot more effective than, uh, like, I, I just saw Insidious Last Key last night. That movie had, like, five jump scares, and they were all pretty mundane and boring whereas at least they tried to be inventive with the jump scares but that's not my type of thing that's that's not my type of horror normally so I'm, I'm glad that when they did do them that they were creative about it they did use a lot of practical effects and a lot of cgi but it's not like a cgi fest where every single cgi moment is super noticeable it feels real that's a big part of of crafting a successful horror movie and i think it did that the next one i want to talk about is blade runner 2049 it's so fucking weird that we got this movie, uh, but I'm so thankful that we did. Uh, Denis Villeneuve is just, he, he is great, man. He is one of the best directors around right now. He did Sicario, he did Prisoners, he did Arrival. I mean, this dude has not made a bad movie yet from what I've seen. Uh, granted, I haven't seen his older works. He is a Canadian, uh, French-Canadian director, so I haven't seen his first two movies, I think it is. But I really want to after seeing everything that he's produced for these big studios. He just has a very unique style. Um, he has a vision for what he wants to do. And Blade Runner 2049, honestly, I think it's better than the original Blade Runner. But it bombed at the box office because nobody went to go see it because, like, all these people that grew up in the 80s watching Blade Runner, they, you know, there's there wasn't quite the audience for it that probably there needed to be. But that's fine because this, you know, this movie is going to last, I think it's going to last a long time and I think it's going to be a cult classic in a lot of ways like the first Blade Runner was. And I hope he doesn't get punished by the studio for it. Ryan Gosling does a great job. Harrison Ford, I'll take him or leave him in it. I, I don't really know how much we needed Deckard to be in there uh, aside from brand recognition uh, but they found a way to make it work it just it, it, it was such a visually stunning film um, I mean the amount of time and effort that went into making this fucking thing is just staggering and I, I you know it's it's scary like as, as somebody that makes films, it's something that I would love to do. It, it, it's something to it make something that high concept in the future. But uh, my God, I mean, I, I can't imagine how much time and effort went into this fucking thing. Every single frame of this movie is beautiful. The characters are just super well developed. Uh, it has one of the weirdest sex scenes of all time. The only gripe... Literally the only gripe I had about it was the villain. This year has not been good for villains. But I was, I'm was i kind of biased because I just don't like Jared Leto. And his delivery was garbage. You know, he always talks a big game about his acting. He always talks about how he does all this method shit. Like how he pretended that he was blind for Blade Runner. And of course all the controversy about the Joker. But unlike actual method actors he just kind of does it as a gimmick you know like you look at christian bale you look at daniel day lewis any of the great methods they they actually become their character uh emotionally and physically they don't just try to inherit basic traits from a character and or you know make up something about the character they do their fucking research and they get inside the character's head and jared leto is just kind of one of those guys that i feel like he does it because he knows it'll win him awards uh, but he he doesn't sell it to me and that's always a big problem and it, it was really obvious in this movie too 
uh, he it, it feels like he was there to, to make a paycheck and he just kind of fucking hammed it up. He's not a good actor, frankly, and I, I don't understand why people heap this amount of praise on him. And he was the only character that was underdeveloped in the film. Uh, you kind of get a very basic idea of his motivations, but he's just kind of bland. But everything else about this film works so well. The only downside for a lot of people is the runtime. I didn't have a problem with it, but I know there are a lot of people that did. If you're curious about Blade Runner 2049, I'd say give it a go. If you're one of those people that has a hard time sitting through pretty long movies. I think this one's almost three hours long. You might have to, you know, rent it or or buy it on, on Blu-ray and just, you know, take a couple breaks while you're watching it. You know, go get some fucking water, get some popcorn, just do something in between. Uh, but I know that for me, it's one of those movies that even though it's super long, I'll sit down and I'll just watch it without doing anything else for an afternoon. I can't heap enough praise on this movie please do yourself a favor and go watch it. It's fantastic. Of course, this was another a big year for comic book movies. A good six movies on my list are, are comic book movies. Uh, so I'm going to tackle those last. Uh, I really want to get into this, not smaller films, but the, maybe the lesser known films that I, I saw this year that I just loved. Um, one of the big ones is uh, Three Billboards Outside uh, Ebbing... Missouri. This one was directed by Martin McDonough, who did In Bruges and Seven Psychopaths. And a lot of times he teams up with uh, Colin Farrell. You know, he just always gets a perfect cast for his movies. This one, he has uh, Frances McDormand in it. Uh, and she does a, a wonderful job. Essentially, she's a mother whose whose daughter died, and so she puts three billboards up confronting the police about them not investigating her daughter's murder. And so it's a very strong character piece for her. It's got Sam Rockwell in it. It has Woody Harrelson in it, and they, you know they're they're larger than life characters. They're these super weird small town police officers that have a lot of issues and of course that kind of spills over into Frances McDormand's life or her character's life it was a very gripping movie it's uh, of course it's fucking hilarious Martin McDonough is, is he's a wonderful dark comedy director and I like that he kind of branched out with this film it's it's not it is a comedy but it's not it's more of a drama than anything else uh, but when there are comedic moments, they're really funny. Peter Dinklage is in it too, but he's not in it for very long. I would have liked to have seen more of him. But the story is is very timely. It's important to tackle injustices, uh, you know, the subject of injustice in our legal system these days. And I think they handled it really well. It's just uh, a great movie all around with a great message and... Uh, until the very end, uh, kind of muddied the message there. Uh, but, you know, taking that injustice in your own hand and pointing it out uh, to others is a very important thing. Uh, and I feel like that was kind of one of the big social things that happened in in 2017 is, is people not taking shit anymore, you know, really standing up for themselves. And this, this movie frames that pretty well. So, you know, if you've seen Ann Bruiser in, uh, or Seven Psychopaths uh, and you want more, you know, check it out. It's not exactly like those ones, but it's worth a watch for sure. So this one got uh, an F cinema score, but I'm going to put it on my list of best movies of 2017. Of course, it probably it's it skirts the line between best and worst but it's got to be Darren Aronofsky's mother. This movie was interesting, to say the least. I saw it uh, on opening day, and I was by myself in the theater. There was nobody else going to fucking see this movie. Didn't get promoted well. The trailers don't tell you shit about what actually happens in the movie, but it was pretty fascinating. You know, if you know Darren Aronofsky, you know that he makes these very personal... Uh, I wouldn't say it was personal. He, he does these very, 
unique uh, character pieces in these worlds that aren't strictly grounded in reality. You know, like Requiem for a Dream. Everything is like hyper real, you know? And he took that hyper realism to an insane extent with Mother. To explain it is kind of difficult. You know, it's, it's tough for me because I don't agree with what he says the motivation of the movie is. Uh, I feel like it's a little bit more open to interpretation and without like reading an interview by him, I wouldn't, I would never guess that it was what it was about. Essentially. I think it was an interview with vanity fair. He essentially came out and said, yeah, mother is a movie that's about the earth and how we're raping and killing the earth and you know, how we need to change things. And it's also uh, a retelling of the Bible and of course, I mean, you could, you know, you look at it and it becomes obvious after you're hearing that. But I went in, you know, completely fresh, not looking at any of that stuff, not looking at any promotional materials aside from like one trailer. My interpretation of it at first was that it was a story about fame and recognition and how that can kind of ruin a person's life. Uh, and it's not all that it's cracked up to be all the time uh, and, and how you know, just success in general, not even fame, uh, can destroy your personal relationships. And, and I, th I thought that was an interesting, I mean, I, you could totally look at it like that, but like when I hear the original meaning behind it, it kind of lost some of its impact for me. It's still a great movie. Uh, of course it's beautifully shot. It's very tense. Uh, there's one scene that's, there's one scene that's pretty fucking traumatizing, I'm not going to lie. Uh, so you just got to be mentally prepared when you go into a movie. Cause I uh, audibly like was like, Oh, like when this shit happened, like I was like, Oh my God. And I, I kind of had to compose myself in the theater, but you know, Aronofsky always has a moment or like that in his movies, but this one just brushes up against the line of over the top. And it's, it's definitely not for everybody. Uh, the majority of people that are going to see this movie are probably going to fucking hate it. Probably the only reason that they went to go see it is because Jennifer Lawrence is in it. I got to tell you, it, it's it's nothing like anything else Jennifer Lawrence has done in the past that I've seen. Check it out. Go in and take it with a grain of salt. Just be open to the experience. It is an experience. It definitely is something that I think needs to be witnessed. But I will com I completely understand if you don't like it too. The next movie I would like to talk about is It Comes at Night. So I'm a big horror movie fan. It's very hard for me to find horror movies that I enjoy. Uh, but I feel like this was a pretty solid year for horror movies in general. What I liked about It Comes at Night was that it wasn't your traditional horror film. Uh, it's kind of this like weird post-apocalypse uh, where there's a virus taking over everything, and, and potentially there's zombies, but you never really see anything. And it's that lack of visual that makes everything in this movie insanely tense and stressful. It's one of those movies where you'll be sitting there watching it, and you're just going to start feeling, you know, some a chill running down your spine. Uh, and it, it does it very well with the pacing and the sound design and everything. And the actors really, really sell this movie. Uh, it stars Joel Edgerton. Um, and it, pretty much everyone else's is a relative unknown. But that really contributed to the atmosphere that this movie created. It's more psychological than anything else. And it's really hard not to get into spoilers. But... The core premise of the movie is that it's this family trying to survive and then they come across another family and they don't necessarily trust this other family because they think they're going to fuck them over and, or, you know, get them sick. So it's it's just one of those things that you just kind of have to sit and watch to really get a feel for it. The only thing that I can say is that it... it plays with your head a little bit too much and in more predictable ways there are a few dream sequences which 
kind of undercuts the horror. Uh, you know, you, you get some really creepy imagery or, you know, a really shocking moment. And they just go, oh, just fucking kidding. We pulled the rug from underneath you. Gotcha. But at least it uses it as a motif to continue building the world in the story. Uh, if, if they had just done it, you know, once, then I would have had a problem with it. If they literally just did one dream sequence just for the sheer shock value. But uh, they use it as a tool to get inside the characters' heads which is very important uh and successfully portraying that visually is tough i understand that so i mean that's the best way that they could have tackled it i liked it a lot uh and i and i like a24 as a, a production company in general they are always putting out fantastic movies they're very good at picking the right movies uh that are very relevant uh at this point in time and they know what audiences want, but it's, you know, it's kind of away from the norm. A hell of a lot better production company than fucking Blumhouse. Uh, and, they, you know, they've A24 has put out a few horror movies, but I like that they kind of go between a bunch of different genres. They've put out some of my favorite movies in the past few years, and I can't wait to see what they come out with next. Along those same lines, another horror movie that I really enjoyed this year... Uh, was Raw. Raw is actually a uh, French horror film. I believe it It actually debuted in 2016 in France, and then it made its way uh, to the U.S. But I, oh man, this movie was great. It's a story about a girl that starts attending this uh, school for uh, veterinarians, and she ends up becoming a cannibal. And, and so it's essentially a story of her. She She's dealing with becoming a cannibal and learning about her sexuality and, and all these other things. You know, it's like this weird, like, college movie, but it's also a really dark horror movie. And it was just, it was super entertaining. Again, it's another really brilliantly shot film. Uh, it reminded me a lot of Kubrick, which, I mean, I haven't seen anything come close to this in American cinema in a long time. I believe this was the director's first film, and so you can kind of tell, but they really have a very distinct style, and they lean a little too heavily on those Kubrick influences at times, but overall, it, it works. It, it just flat out works, and you're you're kind of guessing up until the end about what's going on. But the movie does give you answers, which is important. It, it, that's a very key thing in movies is if you're going to pose questions, unless it's a question that could possibly never be answered, uh, you have to have some type of hint to the audience, uh, you know, some satisfying answer in the wings, you know. And this movie really nails that. Uh, so Raw is... It's up there. Some people are going to get fucking grossed out because of cannibalism and everything. And it's very graphic at, at, and, and one scene in particular. But, I mean, you know, I don't I don't give a shit. I'm a gore hound. I fucking... I love the thing. You know, I love... Again, I love horror. So it was not a moment where I was, you know, oh, I'm fucking queasy. But... Pe people have gotten like that from this movie so that that's just a testament to how good the movie is i think and how well they they pulled it off keeping with that horror theme the other movie that might be my favorite movie of 2017 and it came right at the beginning of the year i think it came out in february is get out which is jordan peele's directorial debut of course i'm, I'm sure the majority of people have already heard about this movie, of course. It's about a, a black man going to meet his white girlfriend's family for the first time, kind of out in the middle of nowhere, and he notices that there's this huge conspiracy going on. Kind of like Stepford Wives or Invasion of the Body Snatchers, where something is really off, but the character in the audience don't know exactly what is going on right away super satisfying movie jordan peele this is another directorial first but this dude absolutely nails it it's 
another one of these horror movies that isn't all about jump scares. It is another more psychological affair, of course, but there are some pretty creepy moments. And, I mean, this is a very fantastic piece of social commentary. It's a very important subject to tackle the disenfranchisement of African-American people in this country. Uh, And, uh, you know, most people, when they see me, they don't know right away. They can't tell. But, I mean, I am one-fourth African-American. And so it uh, it did speak to me, especially growing up in a town that was strictly white people. We had maybe one or two other black people in town. And there's always this feeling that you don't fully belong, and it's very uncomfortable. And this movie nails that feeling, and it it tackles a couple more about your deepest fears. It's another one of those things that I just can't spoil it, because you gotta watch it. Of course, Jordan Peele, you know, he's been in the comedy game for a long time, and so this is a, a more serious piece. There are comedic elements to it. Uh, But I did find it a little bit offensive that at the Golden Globes that this got put in the comedy slash musical category because it's it really I mean, there's there's a handful of comedic moments, some, you know, just some funny visuals uh, that are also creepy. But it's at the end of the day, it's not a comedy. It, It really isn't. It's just kind of to undercut. Uh, some of the darker stuff that's actually going on in the movie. Uh, and he plays with it really well um, by by cutting from something that's super serious, something that's a little bit more comedic. Uh, and he even has a character that's... that's Their sole purpose is that they're comedic relief. They, they basically have their own little B-plot that kind of interjects whenever something is a little bit too real, you know? So it's a fantastic movie. I'm super excited that Jordan Peele's working on The Twilight Zone. Uh, I think that if he's able to bring this kind of unique brand of light comedy and really kind of mind-bending horror, you know, in a a weekly format, it's going to be fucking awesome. If you know me in any capacity, then you'll probably know, or you should know, that Christopher Nolan is one of my favorite directors in the world, in the universe of all time. So, of course, he had to have a spot on this list. I can't not put a Christopher Nolan movie in the list when he comes out with one because he just doesn't make bad movies. I still He's, he's another one of those people like Denis Villeneuve that I haven't really seen a bad movie. Sure, you could argue Dark Knight Rises. It's weaker than some of his other movies, but it's not a bad movie. But anyway, of course I'm talking about Dunkirk, which is a war film in that very unique Christopher Nolan style because he doesn't do it like a straight-laced war film. Of course, a straight-laced war film, you know, in this day and age, is you're looking at something like Saving Private Ryan, Jarhead, American Sniper... Uh, or like the Hurt Locker. There's pretty much two extremes when it comes to modern war movies, where it's either like a deep psychological character study about the horrors of war and how difficult it is to return to a regular life, or these ones where that same thing kind of happens, but they're super patriotic. And it's, it's like, yeah war is hell but like there's glory in it you know it's these movies that are kind of like borderline propaganda to kind of be like hey support the troops not saying we shouldn't support them i'm just saying like sometimes it's a little bit over the top like there was a one about the lady with the bomb diffusing dog and shit and uh that one that just came out with miles teller like all all those i'm just like i'm that's why i'm done with war movies because they don't feel real to me they feel like i'm being told a story about a person and i i can't i can't do that with most of my movies you know they can be out over the top but like don't fucking feed me a story make it entertaining and make it something unique i I can't be force-fed the same shit over and over again i'm not saying that don't get me wrong i'm not i'm not saying that 
Saving Private Ryan does not have some stuff showcasing the horrors of war. Uh, in fact, it's, of course, it's more brutal than Dunkirk is, but Dunkirk really establishes what it was like to be a soldier uh, or somebody just participating in the war in general. Uh, because it, the way that this movie is structured is super fantastic. I personally am not a fan of war movies normally, but I loved how Christopher Nolan was able to split the story up into three very distinct uh, plots. Essentially, we've got a young kid who's just trying to get home, a soldier that just barely survived a massive ambush. Uh, You've got a guy who is a fighter pilot and he is, you know, trying his best to help out his people on the ground while they're coming under attack in this massive battle. And then finally, you have uh, a a boy and his father going on a mission of peace to help evacuate these people that are on the ground. So it's land, sea, and air, uh, which is how World War II was fought. You know, so uh, first of all, just, just that core premise is interesting. But then how he actually weaves the stories together and builds a very tight knit timeline for everything that is happening. Some of the events are running concurrent, but they only really all come together at the very end of the film. Uh, but you constantly have this ticking clock element to each scene. So, like, whenever it cuts between the plots, you have a pretty steady flow of what's going on, what happened, when. There's not a lot of dialogue. Uh, you know, you're, it's, it's more of throwing you into what that experience is like and getting to know the characters through their actions almost strictly. Maybe one or two pieces of backstory, and, and that's about it. Very fascinating stuff, brilliantly acted, brilliantly shot, sound design. Dude, this this was the best fucking sound design of 2017. This movie needs a fucking, a fucking Oscar for their sound design because it, it is very, very tense. It's, it's like you, you feel like you're there when the air raid sirens start going off or a, a firefight bursts out. It doesn't just happen, you know, it's it's a moment, it's an event, it's tangible, you know, you hear the crack of the gunfire in the distance during a lot of the firefights, uh, you can hear the whistling of the bombs when they're dropping, and you get to see it unfolding. It's like this unstoppable horror. The violence is very memorable because it's so minimalist. Uh, that's what makes it really effective. And there's not a, a lot of scoring going on here either. There's only light, you know, things kind of... Uh, there, there's like some, maybe some light strings or some some drums just kind of keeping the pace of, of what's going on. And it's not like you're going to have this big sweeping orchestral, oh my god, our troops are are going home fucking shit. No, it's like you're here, you're going to live through this, and you got to you gotta just fucking stick with the moment, and, and this is how it's going. So, great movie. Can't recommend it high enough. You got to see this one. If you want to experience a fucking masterclass of filmmaking, Christopher Nolan's where it's at. The only downside to this is that I don't think he's working with Wally Pfister anymore. And I still think that his movies where he was working with Wally Pfister are insane. Like the, the cinematography is just fantastic. Not knocking it in this movie. And it's very hard to vary uh, certain scenes, especially with like, the aerial combat and everything like that. Uh, I think the cinematographer did a good job, but I can only imagine what this movie would have looked like if Wally Pfister, his normal DP, was there. But he's gone on to do other things. He started directing. He actually directed Flaked, the Netflix show, and then he directed that god-awful movie, Transcendence. But, you know, he's, he's pursuing his dream, so that's cool. Uh, just hope that he and and Nolan work together again soon. So I'm going to talk about one more big blockbuster movie, 
and then we're gonna go through the comic book lightning round because there's so many fucking comic book movies this year that it's impossible to talk about all of them so i'm just gonna pick out the things that i really liked about each of those real quick uh but before we get to that we're gonna talk about john wick 2 baby i (laughs) just got into john wick this year i know that the first one came out a few years ago and i was like yeah i don't don't know and you know keanu's been out of the game for a while i don't know And then I actually sat down and watched John Wick and immediately was like, oh my god, I gotta watch the second one. And it's just fucking badass, man. Not talking about any technical aspects or anything, you know? Cinematography, whatever, it's fine. Sound design is fine. All that shit's fine. What you're here for with John Wick 2 is the action. The ridiculous fucking shootouts and hand-to-hand combat and the world of john wick is ridiculous it's strictly based around these little pockets of professional hitmen all across the entire world that happen to own hotels it in a weird way it reminds me of kingsman but way less civilized it's basically like when i think of the john wick universe it's like the surface level it's almost like the matrix it's like the surface level stuff like appears normal but like if you just dig a little bit stuff gets really really fucked up and john wick 2 the the dude can't catch a break he can't first his wife dies then or his fiance dies then his dog dies then his car gets stolen and then they blow up the motherfucker's house like (laughs) He is the first action movie protagonist I've ever seen that has had the worst luck in the universe. And that's including someone like John McClane from Die Die Hard. Like, John McClane's always in the wrong place at the wrong time, but, like, his personal life doesn't get fucked up that often. Maybe it happened once in, like, Die Hard 3, but I'm getting... (laughs) I'm getting way off base. Uh, You know, these John Wick movies are fun. I miss having these fun, ridiculous action movies come out, you know, from the the 80s and 90s when it was just out of nowhere. Just here's this fucking ridiculous action film where a guy goes on a path of revenge or, you know, he's in a war and he's just going to fucking kill as many people as possible. And... That's super entertaining to me. Of course, you're never going to top the Raid uh, or the Raid 2 in terms of action. But, I mean, the gunplay and stuff here was fucking awesome. They borrow a lot of, like, gun kata elements from Equilibrium, which is another really badass action flick. But I just like it because it doesn't take itself too seriously. And it's still able to craft a coherent story that's simple, but you enjoy the characters in it. And, you know, they all have... They're not well-rounded characters, but they all have that very base level of want and need that uh, a character requires. So, I mean, if you're looking for a fun time, just John Wick 2 all the way, dude. Gotta go see those movies. Super fun. The time has finally come to talk about the comic book movies. Again, this was a really big year for comic book movies. So I'm just going to run down the list. And here we go. Thor Ragnarok, Logan, Wonder Woman, Guardians of the Galaxy 2, Spider-Man Homecoming, and Lego Batman come out this year. All of them based on comic book properties. All of them were pretty awesome. We got Justice League this year, but I'll get into that in the worst movies of 2017. But this year was just amazing for these big comic book movies. Because again, like I mentioned earlier, this was more of a year about filmmaking in general and giving the powers to filmmakers. And every single one of those movies I just listed, uh, excluding Justice League... Every single one of those movies has a very unique voice, thanks to the director involved. Uh, Thor Ragnarok was just absolutely hilarious. Uh, Taika Waititi did a wonderful job turning the Thor movies around. Thor 1 and 2 just kind of sucked. They're just kind of boring, and, and they're not very memorable movies. This 
Thor Ragnarok just opens with a ridiculous set piece and it just keeps going all the way till the end. It's funny. There's lots of big developments that happen for the Marvel Universe in that movie. And it's just a good time. And I'm so glad that Chris Hemsworth said that he's on board for more potentially after Avengers 4. Then, of course, Logan, it's basically children of men in the X-Men universe. And it's just... It's wild. It's wild that we got an R-rated Wolverine movie. Kind of sucks that it's Hugh Jackman's last turn as Wolverine unless he decides to come back now that this Fox Disney deal is going through. But it was totally worth it. I mean, Logan was fantastic. James Mangold finally was able to deliver his true vision of Wolverine. Not that the Wolverine was bad, you know, the, the one that came before this. But it definitely was lacking something. He went full bore on Logan. Whereas with Wolverine, he had to pull some punches. If you haven't seen Logan, you gotta watch that one. Especially if you're an X-Men fan. I wish I had seen it in theaters. I actually put it off for a long time. Thinking that I was gonna be able to go and see the black and white cut in theaters. And then I missed it. Then of course Wonder Woman was awesome. Patty Jenkins uh, did a fantastic job directing that one. Probably the most generic movie out of the ones on the list, but it still has a very distinct style. Patty Jenkins was really able to sell Wonder Woman as a mainstream character. Not that she's not, but I mean, we haven't actually seen a Wonder Woman movie before this, and this feels like what a Wonder Woman movie should be. The only downside was the ending. You know, the antagonist was bad, but he felt like a video game boss and like the CGI was pretty atrocious. But other than that, the humor was there. The World War One setting worked fantastic for Wonder Woman. And, you know, it didn't like a lot of people were comparing it to Captain America before it came out. And yes, there are some aspects that are kind of similar to the first Captain America movie, but I think that it's a lot more enjoyable to sit down and watch Wonder Woman than Captain America 1. Guardians of the Galaxy 2, you know, James Gunn just coming out swinging. A lot of people said that Guardians of the Galaxy 2 was a little bit too jokey for their taste. I don't know, I thought it was about on par with the first Guardians of the Galaxy as far as jokes go. The cast has fantastic chemistry, and I thought the stakes were bigger. And I mean, come on, Kurt Russell. They added Kurt Russell to the cast. How can you go wrong when you add a legend like that? You know, it was just a fun movie all around. Uh, some really insane set pieces. Of course, there's a shitload of CGI, but it worked flawlessly. Marvel still has, uh, Disney in general, still has some of the best CGI in the business. It looked flawless, and it was a great addition to the Marvel Universe. Then, of course, there was Spider-Man Homecoming 2. Not Homecoming 2. Homecoming also. Home, home, homecoming as well. Anyway, John Watts fucking gave us the definitive on-screen Spider-Man, I think. I love the original Spider-Man movies, barring three. Amazing Spider-Man 1 just felt like a rehash. Amazing Spider-Man 2 is like a guilty pleasure movie for me. It's really horrible, but there's some hilarious stuff that happens in it. And Homecoming was just the perfect balance of lighthearted and funny for Spider-Man. It actually encapsulated what made the comic books so great, or what makes the comic books so great. Because it's Spider-Man, you know, he's a, he's a kid. He's a kid learning how to become a superhero and deal with responsibility and learning what it means to be a hero, not just, you know, some guy that's already established and he's constantly going up against these big threats. I mean, Spider-Man gets his ass kicked in this movie multiple times. He fucks up. And you don't see that a lot with superhero movies. Or if they do, you know, it's just like the hero turns it around real quick. And Spider-Man Homecoming, he flubs a lot, but at the end of the day, he's able to fix things. But he, he couldn't do it without Iron Man. He did need Iron Man's help. I appreciated that they tried to uh, vary it up and make Spider-Man a lot more interesting. John Watts is a f wonderful director. I love everything that I've seen that he's done so far. He also did Clown and he did Cop Car. I enjoy his films because he doesn't just stick to one genre. He kind of likes to blend them. Cop Car is a fantastic thriller starring Kevin Bacon about these kids that 
steal a cop car that just happens to belong to a dirty cop. And Clown is a horror movie, kind of a horror comedy, about a guy who finds this uh, clown outfit in an attic. After he puts it on for his uh, son's birthday party, it starts fusing to his body and turning him into this mutant clown. Dude has a really interesting way of making films. He has a lot of influences that he wears on his sleeves, but he's always super unique about how he tackles projects. Spider-Man Homecoming was drastically different than anything else uh, in the Marvel Universe because it was more like a old-school 80s coming-of-age tale. I mean, if John Hughes directed a Spider-Man movie, this is what it would look like. And I can't wait to see what he comes out with next. I know I keep saying that about a lot of these people, but it's true. Uh, because I, I love his style, and I think that he has a very solid grasp on on filmmaking. John Watts is one of those guys you got to look out for. He's going to be putting out some really crazy stuff, especially after the success of Homecoming. The final comic book movie that I wanted to talk about was Lego Batman. I was not expecting to put a Lego movie on my list, but my god... This movie was fantastic. It was, it was a wonderful experience. It's a great movie for kids and adults. If you're a Batman fan, you're, you're going to fall in love with this thing because it really cares about the world of Batman. Will Arnett does a fantastic job with his gruff Batman voice. The animation is bright and colorful, and it feels real. It feels like you're watching stop motion with Legos, and a lot of it is actually, you know just strictly cgi i i'm sure they use some practical effects uh at certain parts but who knows but it's it's a beautiful movie i love that they they kind of get into batman's head and try to humanize him a little bit more and show how you know everybody thinks batman's so badass because he's this loner and he's this you know dark mysterious guy but, but at the end of the day you can only live like that for so long uh, before the cracks kind of start to show. Like, there's a scene in this fucking movie where Batman goes to the Fortress of Solitude and he's not, he hasn't been invited to a party with the Justice League and everybody is like super bummed out to see him. It's wonderful. It's like one of my favorite movie moments of 2017. Of course, it also delves really deep into Batman's rogues gallery and there's lots of super obscure characters that show up out of nowhere. I think Condiment King makes an appearance. This movie was just crafted with such a love for the character of Batman and DC as a whole by referencing things that only a handful of people would, you know, get right away on first viewing. And of course, that's in large part to Chris Miller and Phil Lord. You know, they've, they've been writing for a long time. They do a lot of comedy movies. Originally, they were uh, supposed to be doing the Han Solo movie, and then that kind of fell through. Uh, but, you know, you know them from 21 Jump Street and, and stuff like that. Last Man on Earth. They've been really, really popular, and they always put out great stuff. They weren't the sole writers. There was, there was a few other writers on the film. But, of course, the director was actually Chris McKay, who's a relative unknown at this point as far as theatrical length films he's done some robot chicken and moral oral a lot of stuff that i just loved on adult swim and of course bringing that unique energy and charm from the adult swim shows and moving it over to this theatrical space and actually being accessible to kids that's a pretty strong hurdle to overcome and i thought he did a really good job with this film I loved it. And, you know, just because it's a Lego movie, it, you know, it's enjoyable for all ages. Uh, I actually like watching a lot of these animated films, but I always have to wait quite a while because there's no way in hell I'm ever going to go see one of these in theaters unless I have kids, which I don't foresee in the near future. But <laughs> regardless, when I see a, a, a really good animated movie like this, I always have to point it out because it's a rarity. Lego Batman... I loved it. Uh, so if you're a Batman fan, check it out. It ranks right up there with the Dark Knight trilogy and the original Tim Burton Batmans for me. So you know it's good. That covers it for all the comic book movies. There's one final, final, final movie that absolutely has to be talked about. It has to. And that's, of course, Star Wars 
The Last Jedi. Oh man, I loved, I loved Last Jedi. And I don't know where I stand in the Star Wars fandom at this point because of that. I've been in love with Star Wars ever since I was a kid. Uh, you know, my dad was always showing me those movies. I'm sure that they took me to see them when they did the first re-release in 1997. I've owned, you know, like 20 fucking copies of, of the Star Wars films. I feel like I'm a, a, a pretty dedicated fan to Star Wars. Uh, and I liked Last Jedi because it didn't feel like a Star Wars film. And that may be blasphemy to some people. I know the movie overall was just divisive for a lot of people, but I liked it a lot. Uh, I liked how Ryan Johnson defied everyone's expectations about what the movie was going to be like, how characters were going to act, uh, and kind of completely steering the Star Wars franchise, or at least this trilogy, in a completely different direction than it was heading in. And it was more or less him kind of unfucking everything up from what J.J. Abrams did. And I, you know, I think I might do an entire episode uh, just to get into nuances of this or maybe a review. But honestly, J.J. Abrams kind of screwed the pooch when it came to Force Awakens. It's not a bad movie by any means, but it really is just a rehash of A New Hope. And, it, you know, the story was kind of the overarching story for the new trilogy was kind of bogged down by this this remake and it was like pigeonholed into fucking doing one thing so it was either just straight up go and make empire again with some minor tweaks or go completely out of left field and that's what ryan johnson did he was like i can't i can't fucking work with this like here's what we're gonna do to fix this so I feel like he righted the ship and I mean it turned Kylo Ren from just this kind of not generic but very one note villain uh, into somebody a lot more complex someone a lot more along the lines of Darth Vader who's a complex villain uh, and to get to that point with Vader you know we had six movies whereas in the course of two Kylo Ren uh, really establishes himself as one of the more memorable villains in the Star Wars franchise. Of course, there was some really interesting showcasing of new force powers and different things like that. I love this movie, uh, and maybe it's I, I'm also biased because I love Ryan Johnson's movies. Like, Looper is still one of my favorite action films. I always say that Looper is the best Terminator movie since Terminator 2, because it is, frankly. Last Jedi is the best Star Wars movie since fucking empire like it's really good uh and that's because it's like when you go to a theater to see star wars at this point there's this oversaturation where you're like okay i know what it is and it can't stay on that trajectory and ryan johnson i feel like he knew that of course there's some stuff that i feel like was definitely disney-fied like porgs they're not bad uh but i definitely feel like that was something that was probably added in by disney uh, and, you know, a lot of people were complaining about Canto Bite. I thought it was fine. Yeah, maybe it feels a little bit like a, a prequel era planet. But really, I, I thought I thought it was just interesting for them to go somewhere a little bit more colorful. Of course, there's plot holes and stuff like that. But, like, if you're really dissecting this movie for plot holes, like, what are you doing with your life? I mean, especially when a lot of... A lot of the stuff Ryan Johnson has already gone on record and said, oh, well, you know, there's a simple explanation for this. It's this, this, and this. You're never going to please all the fans. That's just kind of how it is. You know, the jury's still out. This trilogy could end really, really interesting, or it could just, you know, be kind of generic. I've got to be honest, though, I'm not holding my breath because I don't really know how much I want to see J.J. Abrams return to the helm after Ryan Johnson gave us such a unique film. And, and on top of that, for some fucking reason, this actually really pisses me off, for some fucking reason, Disney decided to hire Chris Terrio to write episode nine, which I'm not okay with, because every single thing that Chris Terrio has written has been garbage. I, like, I don't know how the fuck he keeps getting jobs. He keeps writing these incoherent messes of scripts uh, but again, you know, I'm not reading these scripts. Maybe he does write good material and it's just in the wrong hands. I don't know. We'll see. But like, I'm not 
I'm not stoked for the next two years of Star Wars movies. Like, I'm waiting to see something new, uh, which is what Last Jedi did. I really want to see Ryan Johnson's trilogy, but, like, Solo in Episode Nine, I could kind of take or leave at this point. Of course, I'm going to go see them, but it's not like I'm, like, super hyped for either of them. So that covers it for my favorite movies of 2017. Uh, there were a couple that were originally on the list that I just, I had to cut strictly because of this whole sex scandal stuff. Like I enjoyed Disaster Artist and I enjoyed Baby Driver, but I really don't want to put my support behind those movies. Edgar Wright is a fantastic director and everything. I, st I still think people should watch Baby Driver, but like the context of that movie has just been ruined absolutely ruined by kevin spacey being in it especially when he calls a young man baby and he was accused of grabbing dudes by their dicks so you could kind of see the dilemma there and then just you know disaster artist just won a golden globe but reading about the stuff that james franco supposedly did to people i just can't i can't support it you know i i hope that it's not true but it's kind of scary Be, uh, to, to think about these people creating art uh, and distributing it to people. Maybe it's it's time to separate art from the artists, but it's that's a very tough thing to do. Not something I'm, I'm going to be talking about right now. Although that is some good stuff to talk about in the future, but it's a very sensitive topic, and it's something that I just, I'm trying to steer clear of right now. Uh, so if you enjoyed the podcast, please subscribe, uh, or follow me, uh, whether you're watching on, uh, YouTube or listening on SoundCloud. Of course, I also have, you know, my Twitter handle, uh, at manual elk, uh, manuals, you know, spelled like skateboard manual underscore elk Facebook line them up productions. That's all you have to type in should be the first thing that pops up. If you're on YouTube, but you want to just get the download of this or just listen to it on the go. That's Line em Up Podcast at SoundCloud. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. And this episode's gone on super long. I was trying to keep it a little bit shorter. Uh, so what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to break it up again and do the worst movies of 2017 as its own thing. Because when I go off on, on movies that I dislike, uh, you know, this it could be two hours of me just talking and, and rambling so we'll see how that goes uh but yeah i'll catch you next time